she is easily one of the most admired iconic political leaders anywhere in the world a symbol everywhere for the power of one the power of hope and as her husband once said in a book that he edited the symbol of freedom from fear it is our honor to be interviewing dr ong sang suchi today here in delhi ong sang suchi we were also moved by your incredible public lecture in delhi and one of the things that really struck me was the fact that you still spoke of politics as an ethical calling as a moral calling as it were at a time when there is so much cynicism about politicians and politics everywhere what has kept your faith in the capacity of politics to still be an agent a moral agent as it were of change i think it's simply that i don't know any other way of looking at it this is the where i was brought up to think of politics that politics was to do with ethics it was to do with responsibility it was to do with service so i think i was conditioned to think like that and um, i'm too old to change now you didn't ever lose faith along the way you didn't get cynical you saw some incredibly difficult moments in your life yes but the politics is what you do in the end each politician must decide for himself how she or he is going to approach problems and what other people did was or the way in which other people went about politics was of course basically their business even if it did, if it did affect my life yeah. but that did mean i have had to be like them or i had to decide that i must change my life because other people don't live their lives the way i do personal sa sacrifice often lends political leaders a kind of moral authority that they sometimes don't get in more serene times you have been through some incredible moments of personal loss not being able to meet your husband when he was terminally ill being separated as a mother from your two boys living under house arrest and yet in your lecture you said that there should be less focus on self sacrifice and perhaps more focus on the others those who loved you those who have to let go that their choices and their surrender is almost more difficult and doesn't get told with the same sort of uh, maybe applaud and 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 heroism is that how you process the sacrifice of your family that it was almost tougher for them than it was for you i was not uh, thinking of my family in particular uh, to tell the truth i think it is easier for my family because they were not in burma and because they were not burmese than for the families of my colleagues mm -hmm. those who were put in prison and their families had to struggle to get by and uh, they was they were always under threat as it were from the regime and at the same time they had to take care of the husband or father or, or wife or sister mm -hmm. whoever happened to be in prison and life was very difficult for them yeah. and nobody really acknowledged how difficult it was for them so in a sense did you make your your peace with what was happening to your life by always telling yourself that something much worse was happening to your party colleagues to those who were in prison is that how you made sense of it all no no it was not making uh, trying to make peace with myself or trying to make sense of it it was just recognizing things for what they are you cannot get away from the fact that some of my colleagues families really went through a terrible time you know uh, reading a freedom from fear which of course uh, your husband michael edited and he wrote the introduction to it and in that he wrote about how when when you got married you told him early on that there could be a day that you would have to put your country before your family and and at that time you would need all his love and support but he had to be mentally prepared for it as well how difficult was it for him you think well since he was mentally prepared for it but can can anyone ever really be mentally prepared for something like this and not totally of course yes. you are never really totally prepared for something until it happens but uh, it didn't really come as a surprise to him and you have said again and again that it's about making a choice and and as a politician you made a choice to stay in burma and fight and fight for democracy but every human being has moments of self doubt has moments of what if has moments of looking over your shoulder and saying maybe i could have done it differently do you have any of those uh, those moments of regret or doubt about the choices the incredibly brave choices that you made i've never had doubts about the fact that i chose my country and the cause in which i believed sometimes of course i worry about whether i i did things the right way uh, to do with our work
I read this incredibly moving story. I don't know if it's, if it's true that when you decided you could not leave the country to meet your husband because you may never be able to come back again, you actually taped a farewell message for him that you sent through the British Embassy, but it never got there in time. And I read about this. I, I don't know if that's how it actually happened. Well, I believe it didn't get there in time. And that is so heartbreaking for me to hear. I can't even imagine what you would have felt. I, don't, I didn't think too much about it because uh, what was important was that he should have uh, been able to go as gently as possible. And uh, I do not think it would have made that much of a difference even if he had received the message on time. You spoke about how ever since you've got to India, you're repeatedly asked what your expectations were from India and whether you were disappointed that somewhere along the way India did not stand with the democracy movement in the way that it once had. And you said you were saddened. Are you a little less sad now that you've come here? To, you've seen the incredible, in a sense, response from the people well, of I India? was saddened then, but I got over my sadness a long time ago. Because as I said then, I didn't have the right to expect anything or to feel disappointment. And uh, my friendship with uh, the, the Indian, my Indian friends of long standing did not suffer in any way. Mm. And that kept a very, very steady link between me and India. But an ideological disappointment beyond the personal relationships that, of no, course, as you I had. said, I had, I had no right to be disappointed, because disappointment assumes that you have a right to expect something of somebody, and you're disappointed because your expectations have not been met. It's not like that. It should not be like that between between people, let alone between countries. And of course, politics involves a lot of pragmatism and if India felt that it was more pragmatic for them to follow a certain line then uh, that's a line they would follow and it, it, that may be not what we might have wished for but I don't think we have the right to condemn India or any other country for following the line that they thought was, was best for them. Is there anybody you believe you have a right to expect something from? From myself, yes. And that's it? That's it. Talk a little bit about uh, where democracy stands in your country right now. You've said again and again that it is not an irreversible place. You have also spoken about how it may be time to lift sanctions. Uh, but many Americans worry, many human rights activists worry that if sanctions were to be lifted right now, then perhaps this process that you yourself have described as not irreversible could take a step back. Do you share that concern? I don't think we should keep on depending on sanctions. I don't think we should keep on depending too much on external factors. It is important. External support is very, very important. But I think it's time we started developing uh, our own resources in order to make sure that we keep along the right path. Today you have to, of course, you're, you're in the National Assembly, you're in the mainstream of your country's uh, politics, and you are trying to reach some sort of reconciliation uh, process for your country, but you're having to work uh, with the very regime that put you under house arrest for, for, for decades, that kept you separated from your family, and yet one doesn't see, I don't, I don't know if it's there inside somewhere, but one doesn't see any trace of bitterness. How do you manage to not be bitter? Well, I don't know. I actually tend to like people rather than dislike them. So I think that helps. I think it's I'm temperamentally... Um, much, predisposed to liking? Much, yes, predisposed to like people. Even so, uh, how do you... How do you, how do you make peace with everything you went through and how are you able to trust and that may be the more important question place a level of political trust in a regime that you have suffered at the hands of I don't think of it as a regime I, a regime is made up of people yes. so I, I do put faces to regimes and governments so uh, I feel that all human beings have uh, uh, have, have the right to be uh, given the benefit of the doubt and they also have to be given the right to try to redeem themselves if they so wish. You said in one of your interviews that it's not that you had some pathological dislike for generals. Your father uh, in a sense was the founder of the Burmese army and even though it shocked people to hear this, 
you felt kindly disposed of several generals as well. And this yes. really startled people. Well, people are, some, some I think are actually scandalized. Yeah. But uh, I find this very surprising because I've been saying this for the last 24 years. It's just that people were not listening. I've always said that I've retained a fondness of, for the army. Uh, you must remember that my first memories of my father are of him in uniform because I can't really remember him. I can only remember him from his photographs. Mm. In, mo in most of his photographs, he's in, in military uniform. So I've always thought of people in military uniform as lovable people, if you like. I mean, my father was the person I loved most in the world, and he, was, he always appeared to me in military garb in, mm. in these photographs. Mm. And so it was normal and natural for me to like people in that kind of outfit. And that affection never went away. I disliked very, very intensely the things that the army did, particularly mm. after they took over um, power in 1988. But uh, that has never stopped me from continuing to have a deep affection for the army in general and also an affection for particular people within it. And when people react with complete horror, especially in the West, when you say that, do you, do you just laugh? Yes, it amuses me. And it also makes me understand that they never were listening in the past. If they had been listening to what I had been saying all along, they would have been neither surprised nor horrified. For you, the personal is clearly the political. I think your life epitomizes that. And even in the Nehru Memorial Lecture, you spoke about the love for your father and the love for your country being you know, blur, just blurring, one, one leading yes. naturally to the other. Was that always the case or did you discover that somewhere along the way, that there was no separation between you the person and you the politician? I think it was always the case because I could never separate my father the person from my father the politician. Uh, the, one of the earliest things I learned about him was that he loved his country. I don't know whether this is the kind of thing most children learn about their parents. You have become, as, as you know, even though you never sought it, a kind of post poster girl for human rights uh, activism everywhere in the world, for, for freedom over fear, as I said. Some of, some of your fans and admirers have been disappointed by what they claim is an ambivalence on the issue of violence against the Rohingyas in your country. You have said, I know, already in other interviews, that the situation has been mishandled, but you do not like to talk about specific communities because you think that exacerbates the problem. No, not only that, I'm not ambivalent about my views on violence. Violence is something I abhor completely and yes. condemn completely. But don't forget that violence has been committed by both sides. Mm. This is why I prefer not to take sides. And also, I want to work towards reconciliation between mm. these two communities. I'm not going to be able to do that if I'm going to take sides. But a community that no country wants, I mean, these, these people where Bangladesh says they don't belong to us and your country says they don't belong to us, this is, a very, this is a huge international tragedy. This is a huge international tragedy and uh, this is why I keep saying that the government must have a policy about their citizenship laws. Mm. We do have a citizenship law and all those who are entitled to citizenship under the laws must be given citizenship and we said this very clearly now there are quarrels about whether people are uh, true citizens under the law or whether they have come over as migrants yeah. later from Bangladesh one of the very interesting and rather disturbing um, facets of this whole problem is that most people seem to think as though there were only one country involved in this border issue. Hmm. There are two countries. There's Bangladesh on one side, yes. there's Burma on the other, and the security of the border surely is the responsibility of both countries. Hmm. And at the moment, it just seems as though everybody thinks that the t border is totally the responsibility of Burma. What would be the best solution? What would be the way out of this impasse? Uh, first of all, they've got to do something about law and order. We've got to stop violence from bring, breaking out again, which means uh, adequate security measures. And then I think the citizenship law really must be looked into. And those who are entitled to citizenship must be not only given citizenship, but given the full rights of citizens. And then I think they have also to look to the immigration issue. Is there a lot of illegal crossing of the border still going on? Hmm. They've got to put a stop to it. Otherwise, there will never be an end to the problem because Bangladesh will say all, the, all these people have come over from Burma. And the Burmese say all these people have come hmm. over from Bangladesh. And where's the proof either way?
Yeah, it is. It is a very complex situation, yes. no doubt. Uh, are you worried now that as your country begins to open up to the world, uh, that it will become a kind of battleground between India and China uh, for influence? I'm not worried. It's something that we should keep in mind yeah. that uh, this is how people might see it, and sometimes things turn out the way people uh, perceive them. Uh, so we have to be careful, and we have to be aware of the possible problems. But I don't think worried or afraid would be the words I would use. Just concerned and aware. As you go forward, you obviously must look back as well at some point. What would you count as the most overwhelming or significant moment in your life? Now, it would be very difficult for me to pick one because moment. Because there have been so many. Yes, because there have been quite a number. Let's just talk about what we're calling this, this conversation today, the freedom from fear. There have been very, very blatant attempts on your life. The most dramatic, of course, uh, we, we've read so many accounts of how you just walked towards a, a number of men who were pointing guns at you and you didn't know whether they would shoot or they wouldn't shoot, but they may have. Another incident when you stopped, you stopped your car on the road and you were just assaulted. Your driver managed to get out of that situation somehow, but 70 people died that night in 2003. In both these I instances. I don't think 70 people Oh, that's died, what we read. Is that, is that not no, true? No, I, I, I think uh, there were much fewer than that. Okay, so yes. maybe the accounts of yes. those were not fully accurate. But my point simply being that your life was in danger and you were, you were right there, vulnerable uh, to, to that fact. At every instance, has there been a freedom from fear? Or do you train yourself every time over and over again that I will not allow the fear to dominate? Well, at those times, there's so many things to be to Hold think off. about. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you have no time to think about whether you're afraid or not afraid. You have to think in a very practical way. How do I get out of fear? Uh, well, what do I do? How, for example, at that, uh, the first incident you were talking about, what the, the captain who was um, threatening to shoot her said first was, uh, get off the street. Uh, or we shoot. So I said, well, all right, I'm not going to get myself shot simply to walk down the center of the street. So I said, all right, let's move to the, the side of the street. And then he said, we'd shoot any, he'd shoot anyway, hmm. which is, I thought, rather unreasonable. Then I That's thought, an well, understatement. <laughs> in that case, we might as well get back on the street again. <laughs> I do understand what you mean, that at that time, it's not about philosophical questions, yes. but it sometimes can impact your choices going forward. So at some point, you do ask yourself, I could die doing this. Is it worth it? Uh, no, you think in practical terms. I mean, of course, when I thought to myself, well, if he's going to shoot, if we're walking down the center of the road, then okay, sensible, we'll move to the side. One of the things that has often been said about you is that you're an intensely spiritual person and that that spirituality is also uh, not separate from your politics. Is that something that has given you strength over the years? Because you seem very, I, I, I mean, I'm meeting you for the first time, but you seem so calm that one derives a sense of calmness just by talking to you. And one always wonders, how does somebody who's gone through everything that you've gone through seem so serene and so strong? Well, I don't know about spirituality, but I do have a sense of humor, and I keep, it, it reminding, I keep reminding people that that helps a great deal. And is, is, that, is that where you think your source of strength comes from? All these years, you must have needed something to turn to, music, well, I humor. Have, there have been times when I've been alone um, under house arrest, and I thought to myself that the situation was rather funny. Really? Yes. You even said in one interview that they were rather nice to me. What's so bad about like, staying in your house? I mean, surely you were being ironic. No, no, they were nice to me. You really think I, that? No, this is, this is the truth. They, oh, they wrote terrible things about me in the state newspapers at the time. They kept me under house arrest. Yes. But when they act, when uh, my, how shall I put it, my security officers came to see me, they were always very nice to me. You didn't feel the claustrophobia eating you up of just being locked into your house? No, it's quite a big house. <laughs> More seriously, when you, when you were given the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. you said that it, it, it opened up a door in your heart. Mm -hmm. what, did that, what did that moment of recognition mean to you? Because you did say somewhere else that at least it was a reminder that the struggle for democracy had not been forgotten. And that was very yeah, important. This was it, because the, that was a very difficult time for our party uh, soon after the 1990 elections. That was the time when the... Um, the SLAW, the State Law and Order Restoration Council, decided to come down very, very heavily um, on our party to try to destroy it. Yeah. I, think, I think they really wanted to destroy it. Yes. So 
it was very difficult and uh, everything sort of came to standstill within the country and it was very very heartening to know that even though things were not moving inside the country people outside cared and they were moving and they were doing what they could to protect us and at this moment when there is so much debate in the world over whether countries should be left to find their own democracy formulas and there is no one size fits all and we've seen that given what what's happened with the Arab Spring there is no one neat little formula do you want your country to be left alone now to find its own path or do you still need international focus on it because it's so fragile of course oh, and let's not rather than focus let's put it as awareness I would like the world to be aware of what is really going on in Burma I think too much optimism doesn't do us any good either uh, but we do need the world with, uh, with us. In this day and age, you can't do without the rest of the world. Mm. But at the same time, the Burmese people must grow up for themselves and assume their own responsibilities, which is why I was saying earlier that it should not all be dependence on sanctions and external pressure. Mm. I think external uh, moves do help, but we have to take the major responsibility for the uh, democratization of our country. What are some of your, 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 your concerns when you say the reckless optimism is, is, is not a good idea right now? Is it that till the constitution in a sense is, is, is amended, till institutionalized the, changes are brought? The constitution abroad? is very much a problem. Yes. And if you want a simple answer as to how you can find out whether Burma is really on the way to democracy, then uh, you've got to look at whether there is enough impetus for change in the constitution. Now, you've led an extraordinary life and so much has been written about you. A movie has been made about you. Have you seen the movie? No. Do you plan I to? Don't, no, I don't plan to. And is that because you feel it's a bit unreal to watch no, yourself would, on I screen? Would, I think I would find it embarrassing. Do you, do you get used to the sort of, are you used finally to, to the intense attention on you? Because you seem to be a very private person, yet the whole world wants now a bit of you, they, you know, now that you're out and, 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 and able to step out of your country, so many people want to know you better. Well, I think of it the other way around, rather than the attention of the world on me, I, I think of it in terms of how much attention I'm able to pay others. And uh, I hope that I manage to pay them the attention that I should be paying them. Sometimes it's a little difficult because there are so many people and so many countries and organizations that are good to us and I do really want to make sure that they know we, appre we appreciate. I know you said in one of your talks I think at San Francisco if I'm not wrong that you didn't see yourself as infallible you didn't see yourself as, uh, as saintly in that sense that you had weaknesses and, and fallibility. I never thought of myself as saint it makes me uncomfortable when people say that I'm one. I can imagine but any, any specific things you wished you'd done differently anything any mistakes you feel you made? Oh, I'm sure I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Uh, to begin with, I have a bit of a temper, and I think I've got to learn to keep it under control. Well, that's an honest admission. Let me end by asking you, you've, you've come back to the city where you went to school, you went to college, you've been meeting with old friends. Do, have, you, have you got an evening off from everything to just spend time with them? Have you managed to go and see some of the old haunts in Delhi? Well, the, the very day I arrived, I spent the whole afternoon with my old friends and we went for a walk in Lodi Gardens as we'd always intended to. Well that's lovely to hear and we hope you'll come back to India again and again. I hope so too. It's a land of which I'm very very fond. I never think of India as a country somehow. I always think of it as a land. It makes it much more romantic and much more open well, I think India, and all-embracing. I think it's very special to so many of us that you went to school and college here because it makes us feel that maybe we can just claim a little bit of you oh, as I'm our own. Oh I'm very happy to be claimed. Thank you so much, Anshan. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.